this is actually a little bit more heavy into what I, you know, kind of studied. Uh, this is something that you will not probably get in your basic horticulture classes. Does, does that sound okay? Yeah. Joe? Okay, so, th but this is something that you'll get in more advanced kind of plant physiology specialized courses as you get into graduate school. But, um, and things that I've learned on the fly in the garden, my own personal experience and through others' experience, through Ryan Neal's experience, uh, Michael Hagedorn's and other clients. So, um, but this is really interesting, a really interesting topic. And um, a lot of this actually, although it is the science, uh, there's the heart of it is science. You know, a lot of this has kind of come from just a feel in the garden, how we handle things and then going, oh, wow, I did this thing and it, it yielded a good result. Why did that happen? You know, we take a look at why that happens or whatnot. So um, I've kind of put this together. I don't know of anyone else that, that talks about this. So this is, this, this is kind of a, a really good topic. So um, not a super long uh, lecture as far as uh, slides, but definitely time consuming when we start talking about different things. Um, so hopefully there's a lot of questions. If there's a lot of questions, that means that you guys are understanding it. It's good material. If there's no questions, that means that you probably didn't, it all went over your head and mine as well. But anyways, uh, Rick and Janet, um, just to give you a little disclaimer, they may know the answers to some of these questions I'm going to ask today. And they are very intelligent, but they may have got a little sneak peek. Where I, let, I, let, I tend to let these things slip out while we walk through the garden. So, so uh, yeah. Uh, okay. Um, so today I want to kind of go over uh, minus nutrients. We went over nutrients yesterday pretty heavily. Okay. But we're going to talk about light and temperature. Uh, and then we're going to talk a little bit about water. But one thing that's not up on this, I forgot to edit that, is we're going to talk about health. Okay. Health of plants. And this is something that... Um, Ryan Neal is, uh, is really uh, discovering and um, changing his, the way that he does things um, and he teaches this to his students and I'm one of them obviously but this is also something that is very um, becoming more and more popular in the horticulture world and the science aspect of it, plant science and plant biology as they're learning more and more about um, the relationships that plants have with their environment. Okay, So we'll talk about that a little bit. All right, so you guys know me already, okay? Um, remember this, all right? So just keep that in mind. There are practices that we do, things that will change day to day, and then there, there are the principles. So just remember, focus on the principles, then we adjust our practices for that, okay? Today there may be some technical jargon again, so if, if something's just too technical, just tell me, ah, I don't need to know that information, just give it to me um, in a different way, all right? So we'll talk about today, we'll talk about light, um, several different aspects of light. We'll talk about temperature. Um, we'll go into a little bit about dormancy. Okay, that's um, something that, you know, sometimes people say, oh, well, it's kind of a winter topic. Well, I think it's a topic for any time of the year, and I'll tell you why. Um, but just one slide on that, but we can talk more in depth on it. Okay, we'll talk about health. Really, what is health? Okay, and then a little bit about uh, watering, but more so um, about what cultural practices we can do to establish good plant health, okay? All right, and then obviously, uh, if you have questions, uh, feel free to, answer, to ask them at any time, right? We'll have a little discussion. Okay, just a reminder, I put this almost in every one of my presentations. This is, these are what plants need, okay? They need light, right? They need air, they need water, and they need nutrients, all right? So this is very important when we're thinking about stress. Very, very important. All right? There's a mnemonic thing. Is there? What is it? Lawn. Oh, wow. Maybe it's subconscious because I, I work with turf so much. That's good. Lawn. <laughs> what does your grass need? A lawn. Okay. Good. All right. Okay. We went over this yesterday as well. Okay. So just remember that. So plants photosynthesize, that's how they gather the energy that they need, okay, and the carbohydrates that they need to um, fuel their metabolic processes, okay, so this is very, very important, right, okay, so and what's interesting about this, when we look at that, that equation, we have carbon dioxide, we have six molecules of water, we have, then we have this thing that's light, okay, well, that's a very ambiguous term, right, um, so there's light. Well, not all light is created equal. Okay, not all light is the same. So we'll talk a little bit about that light. 
And um, it's always a little bit difficult subject for me to talk about, mainly because how do I really, how do I control that? I can't change that. The sun does its thing. I don't really know. But if we can understand how plants respond to light, we can maybe do, tweak a few things here and there, right? Okay. All right, so what about light? Okay. You guys have seen something like this, right? What is this, Roy G. Biv? Red, green, what is it? Red, orange, yellow, green, indigo, or blue, indigo, violet, something like that, okay? All right, so that's, it goes from this way to here, okay? Well, if we look at it wavelengths, or we have very short wavelengths and long wavelengths, okay? Very fast light, very slow light, okay? Um, so what light, okay? is best for plants. What do plants need? What do you guys think? Okay, maybe. 550, okay. What else? Different plants like different things. Right? Okay. So when we look at this here, this wavelength, this is kind of what we talk about um, light. Hmm, actually this is I don't know if it's light now that I'm thinking about it. Uh, it would be light quality, okay, and then there's a little bit more we can go, and then it would be the, the quantity, okay, but this would be the quality of light, okay. And then there's a different thing called intensity, and we won't get into that today because I really don't understand too much of that, all right. But plants, as far as photosynthesis is concerned, just photosynthesis, okay, the most photosynthetically active, okay, range of light, where do you guys think it would be? What do you think? On the left and on the right. What are they trying to capture? Or what are they trying to do when they're photosynthesizing? Converting air and nitrogen to CO known to oxygen. Okay. So they're 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 trying to take light energy and convert it into chemical energy, right? Yeah, right? So these are the fastest. This is the highest energy. Well, over here, those ultraviolet rays um, and lavender, uh, too much energy, way too much energy, okay? These are the same things that burn our skin. There's too much energy, okay? Over here, especially as you get further, okay? Not enough energy for photosynthesis, okay? Yeah. 550, what do you think? What color are most plants. Green. green. Okay. So what does that mean? If you remember. Okay. What do you think? If you remember from grade school, if something, if my, my shirt's white, what is it doing? Reflecting. It's reflecting all of the light and it, it's perceived as white. Okay. So Rick's shirt is green. What's it reflecting? Everything it's reflecting green and nothing else, right? because it will reflect, what we see is what reflects, because that green color is being transmitted into my eyes, okay? So that, so his shirt, I guess you could say technically it's every color but green, right? Okay, so plants are every color but green as well. Okay, but the, our eyes perceive it as that color because that's what's being reflected, right? So chlorophyll is green, okay? And that's why plants are green. Well. If you put plants under green light, zero photosynthesis will happen because they're reflecting it constantly. Okay. So there is a professor. There's a professor at Cal Poly right now. His name is Dr. Still, and he studies um, a lot of different things. But he studies lettuce um, and the effect that light has on their germination. Okay. And so if he has certain seeds and light is affecting their germination, he can't work with light. So how does he see in his lab? every light bulb is green in the lab. Okay, that's how he sees in the lab. So when he's working in a certain lab, he actually has a lab kind of like this. It's a, kind of like a big freezer almost. Um, and then there's a door. And when he opens up his benches and his different freezers that have light, uh, that have seeds in them, okay, that door has to be closed. If the door's not closed and he goes and opens this, uh, an alarm sounds, okay? And to tell him someone got, has to close the door, and someone has to turn off all the white lights and turn on the green light. And then you open the door, the alarm won't sound. So he's got that wired that way. Because that's how 
um, sensitive seeds and plants are to light. So the green lights come on and he works in the green light, right? Very interesting. So plants do not respond to green light. That's why they give it away. They reflect it, okay? But they do respond to this light in here and this light in here, okay? So the most photosynthetically active light is somewhere right in here, okay? Between 400 and 500 nanometers up until you get to about green, okay? This is the most active. This is too much. This is the most productive, okay? This is nothing, and you have some productivity in here as well, okay? And then no productivity, or very little productivity, or no productivity photosynthetically on the other side, okay? So, does that make sense? Okay, so pretty straightforward there, all right? Okay. Okay, so that's kind of what we talked about. Really, light, um, the most beneficial light for plants, okay, is um, dependent on the stage of growth, right? So a seed, for example, a seed does not necessarily need ultraviolet light, doesn't need blue light, it actually needs red light, and we'll talk about that a little bit later, okay? But it perceives red light and far red light, which is even slower, okay? So further on into here, like 760, 780, 800, all right? So that far red light is what is cruising around at night, and um, certain animals can perceive that. We can't perceive it as well, okay? But if we get into an area where it's pitch black and we have an infrared camera, we'll see everything, okay, on that camera. Um, because it's just very slow light, but our eyes perceive it as darkness because the light is traveling so slowly we can't pick it up, okay? Um, so blue is the most photosynthetically active, all right? Now, I'm not sure what my next slide says. Okay, yeah. Now, what time of the day, what do you think, as far as if we look at the times of the day and the type of light, what times of the day have more blue light, what times have more red light? What do you think? Okay. You guys agree? Okay. And then when's the blue? Okay. What do you guys think? Do we agree? So do we think the blue's midday and the reds are on the ends of the day? Or do we think the blue's in the beginning of the day and the reds are on the end of the day? This is an interesting question, or interesting topic. Okay, but what do you guys think? Okay. Does it seem pretty blue? I don't know. What do you guys think? It's hard. We're, we're not the best judges of that with our, with our eyes, right? Because we just, we just see just a bunch of bright light, okay? But, um, you know, I was always taught, and it's funny because this is what everyone says, it's speculated that blue, there's a higher quantity of blue light in the morning and a higher quantity of red light in the evening, okay? That's what's speculation. I don't know why it's speculated because I swear we have tons of things to measure that, right? So I'd have to, maybe we should ask Wikipedia, but that's kind of in the horticulture world, that's what they think. And maybe it's because it's really not that important to certain people. Maybe there's not enough funding to figure out that question. I don't oh, know what it is, right? right? Well, well, um, it's, not, it's not as important because they now have things, and a lot of golf courses will have this as well, if they're a high-end golf course. It's a, it's a PAR meter, P-A-R meter, and it basically measures the intensity of the light. So it doesn't really matter what kind of light quality is. If we can, the intensity of the light will tell us how much light is actually in there, and then a certain intensity will yield a certain amount of photosynthesis. And so PAR means photosynthetically active radiation. And so they just detect a certain amount of radiation from the sun and they can, they can figure out how much photosynthesis is probably the potential photosynthesis during that time of the day. Okay, it's PAR, P-A-R. And I actually measured that um, quite a bit when I was in grad school. Uh, basically what it is is full sun, okay, is uh, about 2,000 micromoles per millisecond, or micromoles per meter squared, or something like that, okay, um, of light. Um, so, yeah, interesting. Okay, but um, what's important for us to know, you know, I really think that the morning is the most productive time for photosynthesis. 
not only because it probably has more blue light, but because it also has cooler temperatures, higher humidity, and you have better light. Okay, so the morning time is really the best time of the day. So I've seen many trees and plants that get lots of sun, but if their sun that they're getting during the day, maybe there's six hours of sunlight, is from like one to sundown, versus other plants that get sunlight from sun up to about one o'clock in the afternoon, much, much more healthy, okay? And but I don't know, is that just, that's just my opinion. That's what I've, that's what I've seen. What about you guys? There's an interesting correlation I was talking to Andrew about today. There's yeah. a lady in our club that grows mom made. Uh-huh. Really small little things, you know, the ones that yeah. hold three or four or five in the He has, he has them on an outdoor sill in between two buildings. Okay. So he's getting 11 to 1. Yeah. Very intense light for a short period of time. Yeah, probably, right? Mm -hmm. Very few leaves, very few, I mean, it's, it's biomass is very little. It doesn't need a lot of energy, right? So probably too much light, it, it's, so probably it only takes in, you know, a certain amount of energy during the day. And then if it's sitting there and it's exposed to sunlight, now all it's doing is just defending itself. So if it's only photosynthesizing for two hours of the day and it defends itself for the other eight hours of sunlight, you know, what does that do to a mommy? Uh, it stresses it out a lot. Okay, a larger tree, it can handle it, okay? A landscape tree can handle everything all day long, right? Okay, so that's kind of, that's interesting. Yeah, yeah. that was yeah. interesting. That's very interesting. growth he gets. Right. But whenever he does bring something, you know, five, six, seven leaves. <laughs> yeah. But, you know, it's because it's so small. Right, and maybe he doesn't want a lot of growth. I mean, he's gonna, they're going to pop out of those little pots. I mean, I've seen that happen. Yeah. Joe, do you have a question? Yeah, I had a uh, Yeah. They did really well at that space mm -hmm. uh, because the afternoon the red light was blocked. Right. But uh, if I moved them out of that space, it would Yeah. Okay. There's another important thing is not only red light, but also heat. Okay. Yeah, that heat. And we'll talk about that too. Yeah. So you guys have witnessed something similar? If you had to choose, right? If I had to choose, I'd probably get light until from sun up to maybe one or two, maybe not. You know, but I, you know, I was in a situation where I got light from yeah sun up to about noon and my my trees did very well i didn't need shade cloth right but there's other things going on there temperature mm -hmm. yeah and temperature is another factor and then suddenly a lot more complex which is another factor okay and then we get wind and then we get all these other things and there's a lot of factors in there kathy do you have a question well i've always pushed people to have more morning sun than afternoon sun right because of california yeah because of this west coast mm -hmm. Yes. In the morning, but sometimes in the afternoon. Uh, but it's just too much, too long. We rarely have any clouds in the sky. Yeah. I mean, if, if during the summer, if, if it's a cloud, it's usually a little bit of fog, and mm -hmm. that's gone. And it burns off. Back east, they get the thunderheads. They get the storms coming in in the afternoon, so it's not as critical. Right. But yeah. here, it's just way, way, way too Oh, yeah, and we, you know, right now, what's our day length at? Something like still 10 hours, something like that, right? Mm -hmm. In June, it was 14 hours of sunlight. So that's, that's intense, right? Um, but yeah, I, I, I'm kind of a firm believer of that as well. But, uh, you know, you get in a place of maybe where Rick and Janet are and they have a lot of fog. You know, I actually, even when I was at my other place, I, I put my bonsai garden in on the south side of the house so I can get every bit of light that I possibly could. And then I could dictate how much light I wanted to cut out with my shade cloth, right? Because I like to... If someone's going to say, hey, do you want water? How much? I say, well, give me as much as I possibly can take. And then whatever I don't use, I'll save. You know? So I, I'm kind of the same way with resources. I like the same way. Yeah. What kind okay. of shade cloth do you use? I use, and we'll, uh, we can, we'll talk about this now, which is fine. But, but uh, I use a shade cloth that's called Illuminet. Okay? And um, I have a little, just a little bullet point on that. We can talk a little more about that. But the good thing about Illuminet okay, is... Um, it, it's called kind of a polycarbonate material. Um, almost feels a little bit like plastic, but it's reflective um, on both sides, but really what it is, and it just looks like foil. So it's aluminum. And uh, it basically, it 
allows light in, depending on how tightly woven the, the net is. Um, but then it also reflects the excess light that's not being transmitted through the screen. It reflects that light back. And so what does it do when it reflects that light back? Actually, it also reflects the other negative uh, things with light, which is heat. Okay. And so we'll look at that as well. All right, okay, so let's, now we're on that topic. What else does light do? Light not only helps plants, plants photosynthesize, but what else does it do? Oh, I cheated. What else? Yeah, okay. It causes heat, right? Because all of that other energy that's not being absorbed, the ultraviolet rays, okay, even the red light, the blue light, if there's too much of it, or it's not getting hitting the actual leaves, but it's hitting the pot or something like that, any of that. So all of that excess light is generating heat, okay? So heat is one. What else? What else does light do? Anyone else? Okay, we'll talk about that. So this, so this is a good topic, maybe, if we don't have all the answers. Okay, so this is important here. Light intensity plays a role in leaf development. Okay. So if you guys have seen, how many of you have ever seen a tree that has leaves that are in full sun that are smaller than other leaves on the tree, a little bit lighter in color, okay, and then you have a leaf that's inside kind of more inside the canopy or down below that's being shaded, very dark green and a lot larger. Okay. You guys seen that? Okay, so that's what we call sun leaves and shade leaves. Okay. It's kind of like the oak leaves. Just like the oak, right? We've got those little leaves that are out there and they're getting scorched by the sun and they're getting stressed out. So they're small, a little bit lighter color, and you've got darker leaves and bigger leaves. Okay. So generally the characteristics between a sun leaf and a shade leaf, the differences are you have your shade leaf it's generally smaller, okay? It's also a little bit thicker as far as like thickness of the leaf. And then it's generally a little bit lighter in color, okay? If it's lighter in color, if it's a lighter green, what does that mean? Yes, it has less chlorophyll, has less of that green pigment, and chlorophyll is what photosynthesizes, right? We can say that, yeah. Um, it does reflect a little bit more light out, right? But it's, um, yes, okay, and that's why it's so much, so thick, okay? So it's thicker because it uses more energy to develop a thicker cuticle layer because not only is it getting more light and UV rays, it needs to protect itself, it's also getting more wind exposure, it also needs to protect itself from that, okay? So there's lots of damage that can happen from the environment, and so it, it spends more energy developing a thicker cuticle layer to protect itself, okay? It's, a lighter, it's lighter in color because it's getting a lot of intense light and therefore the chlorophyll that's in there is, is photosynthesizing a lot, okay? And so it doesn't need as much chlorophyll to produce the same amount of energy, okay? Yeah. The, sh the shade leaf is darker in color, right? Okay. Generally. But, huh? I, maybe I did, yeah. yeah. Okay. Right. Okay, so we're talking about the sun leaf, right? They we're talking about the sun leaf, okay? It's smaller, it's thicker, and it's a little bit lighter in color, okay? Less chlorophyll. Less chlorophyll. Less photosynthesis, okay? Well, not exactly. Less chlorophyll because there's a lot of light coming through, okay? And they don't have to capture as much because there's just excess light. There's a lot of light, okay? Does that make sense? Yes, exactly, okay? And generally, it's also thinner because it's using its resources to get to be larger. It doesn't need as, a thick, as thick of a cuticle layer to protect it from sunlight. It actually needs a thinner cuticle layer so more light can penetrate the leaf and it puts out more chlorophyll so it can actually gather the light that's there, okay? So it's very similar to if you look at it like your financial assets. Let's say you have you know, five properties and they're in San Francisco and you're making a ton of money because your grandma donated them to you and you didn't have any mortgage on them and your, your property tax is low because whatever. 
okay, and you're making a lot of money, you only need a few properties. Well, if you got properties in Elk Grove, southern Sacramento, uh, homes are maybe 300,000 there. Mortgages, your mortgage may be about 1,500 bucks and you can charge about $1,700 in rent. You're making 200 bucks a month, if that, right? So now you need 30 properties in Sacramento to be making the same amount of money that you're making in San Francisco with five properties, okay? Does that make sense? Very similar, so it's real estate, really, All right? So those sun leaves, they're getting, there's just excess uh, resources and they're, and they're fine. That's why they're a little bit lighter in color. That doesn't mean they're chlorotic and yellow, but they're a lighter green versus a darker green, okay? And they're smaller for all of those reasons. The smaller they are, okay, also the less water they require as well, okay? And then, so, I don't know if you guys have seen when you, if you remove some of those leaves that have been out in the sun and you have some shade leaves underneath, those things burn fast, okay? They can burn very fast, and that's that reason. So, plants, okay, they develop based on their sunlight, okay? So, a um, couple things. If you want a small plant, so for example, there are certain trees that I'll, you know, if they lose their leaves, I'll just put them in full shade during you know, during the winter time, that's no big deal. As soon as I see those buds start to swell, I put them in as much full sun as I possibly can if it's not too hot. Why? Because then those leaves will develop in full sun, they'll stay smaller, they'll develop a thick cuticle layer, and now they're ready for some of the heat in the spring. I leave them in the shade, they develop very big, kind of leggy, very thin, put them in the sun, they're done. Okay, so it's very important. When leaves are emerging, to remember the type of light that they're receiving, and then that will help dictate where, what we can do with them later on in the season, okay? Now, if you, if you guys think of that practice, what could you do then? Um, could you, is there anything that you could do practice-wise that could help manipulate a few things? Where you place your trees or? Yeah, well, let's say you have a tree that you forgot, you left it in the shade too long, and it pumped out a ton of leaves, full flush of leaves, and they're really large, very supple and soft, kind of dark green, and you're going, great, I need to move it out into the sun because I have another plant, another tree that's more sensitive and needs to take the spot. What do you do with that tree now? Just put it out in the sun and just let it burn? Mm. Maybe trimming some of the leaves off, right? What would that do? Okay, and we'll talk about this a little bit later, but we're kind of. It, it might force some of the buds to come out, but. Yes, right away, okay. Right away, suddenly we go, hey, we had 100 leaves and they need so much water. Now we cut them down to 70, 30% less water immediately, instantly, okay. So that is one thing. Now it goes, well, hey, Okay, maybe my leaves will get sunburned, but maybe they won't because now I have the same amount of roots that was providing water to 100 leaves. Now it's providing 30% more water to each leaf and maybe it can cool off the leaf a little bit more efficiently, okay, more productively. And so that's, that's a way that we can do. Um, we can use that principle and kind of create a practice to tweak something, right? Yeah, Gordon. Cloud would be very good on that, yeah. Cloud would be very good. Well, but now if you, if you co combine the two, right, you remove some of the leaves, uses less water, put some cloud cover on them just to make sure they don't burn, but you remove some of the leaves, so now you're gonna get budding back in full sun. Now you get very small leaves in full sun when you get the budding back and you have a full flush of growth. Now cut off all those big leaves and your tree looks decent, right? So that, you can combine all of those and kind of get a synergistic effect. That makes sense? Yeah. Isn't that interesting though? Which leaves you want to cut off? Well, that's the thing. Yeah, that's, that's, uh, that's the question of the day right there. Well, with my variegated maple, I want to mm. cut off the ones that aren't variegated. Mm -hmm. And that might not be the ones that are on the outside. Some of them are on the inside. Yeah. Your variegated maple may be something that you use that uh, cloud cover or the, um, what is it called, stress? And I stress 2000 or whatever, maybe you use that once a month, every six weeks on it. Maybe, I don't know. Maybe you put it on in June and you put it on in September and then, and then you don't. You know? well, I don't know. You, you need to put it on more often. 
Oh, really? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. The and the cloud cover depends on how what your ratio is, but it lasts a little bit longer. But UV rays will will break it down and also water. Yeah. Okay. One of the problems we run into with heavily variegated mm -hmm. ones that have more light in them yeah. green, you can't take them out of too much sun. You can't. Because then they die. Yeah. They get very weak and they can't yep. produce what you need. So sometimes you need to leave until showtime. Yeah. Yeah, maybe, it right. Is a and and the nature, yeah, the nature of variegated, right? Most plants aren't naturally variegated, uh, you know, evolutionarily. That's a mutation, right? So what'll happen in nature? It'll get a variegated leaf and it'll look pretty and whatever, and then something will come along and the sun will burn it and it'll die out. Okay, and maybe we'll put out something again. The sun will burn it and it'll die out again. Okay, but when humans came along, they said, "Ooh, that is awesome." cut it off, let's propagate it, and let's keep that going, right? Um, and if you put it in the right situation, it'll do fine. But generally, just variegated plants, they just do not do well in the sun. And mainly, it's probably because, you know, that light transmits too, too efficiently into the leaf and heats things up real fast, right? So, because that light is not being, re it's not being captured by photosynthesis, it's just going straight in and just wreaking havoc on, on the leaf, okay? So I think that's kind of why, why that happens. But I'm not an expert on that. Yeah. <laughs> is variegation, I heard that the variegation is induced by a virus or something like that? Some <laughs> variegation is, yeah. Uh, Nandina domestica, that reddish color on the leaf, is because of a virus. They induce a virus into it and it doesn't kill it, but it just causes the plant to stress a little bit and the stress hormones cause the red and blue pigments to come in and turn the leaf a little bit reddish color. Yeah. So we wouldn't want to heal it. No, you want to leave it. Well, it's a virus, you couldn't even, there's nothing you can do with for that anyways. Uh, yeah, okay, so as we were talking about leaves, they acclimate to light, right? So what's, what's acclimation and what's adaptation? Okay, I'll give you a very good example and there's a few pictures I have of some red redwood um, leaves but you, you find a tree, this happens with pines a lot. It could happen with oaks, but maybe not all of them, okay? You find a tree and you go, oh, I have a genetic dwarf. This is awesome, okay? And it's got little needles and it looks great and everything's really compact. You take it out of the mountain, it roots, does really well, and now your leaves are eight inches long. Your needles are just and you're going, dang it, what the heck happened, right? Well, it's not because the leaves weren't small, the needles weren't small. At that point, you know, the needles were not small because it was a genetic mutation or it was an adaptation, okay, or it evolved to have leaves that small. That was what we call an acclimation response, something that happens over one life cycle, one li lifetime, okay? So during that tree's lifetime. Now, if that tree had produced offspring and then that offspring all lived, but everything that had big leaves died off, and then the things that had small needles or small leaves produced again and again and again several generations down the road, that would be an adaptation or evolution, okay? An adaptation, and now you have a smaller leaf, okay? So um, there's a difference between acclimation and adaptation. So acclimation happens over a short period of time, adaptation over several generations, okay? So when you get something, uh, pygmy cypress, Okay, pygmy cypress is an acclimation, all right? You take those out of that soil and you put them in the garden, that thing just, just turns into a monster right away. I've seen many pygmy cypress look like seedlings because someone put them in a bigger container, let them grow out, and all of that bark's left off and they're super shiny and smooth, like a baby's bottom. It's weird, okay? But it's an acclimation response, right? Yeah. And you're like, wow, what is that? Well, yeah, it's really thick now. You got a big trunk, but it's super smooth and shiny. And it just looks like a really young tree. It's not the same tree. Now you gotta go and put it in a smaller pot and wait 10 to 15 years for it to really bark up. Okay, so leaves will um, respond to light, that's a, but it's an acclimation response. So that's not a bad thing. That's actually a good thing because when we understand that, it can happen in a very short period of time. That means that we can get smaller leaves. We can get smaller needles in our lifetime, okay? We don't have to let that 
tree propagate over and over and over and over and over to get a smaller needle. Okay? That's why there are very few tree geneticists. Okay? I think there, there's probably not any because they would have died before their results came in. Okay? Because trees live longer than them. So all the geneticists are looking at grasses and things that seed several times in a year. All right? Or seeing the things that have a, they, they look at certain weeds. A Rabidopsis is one of them. Okay? And that's just a weed, a little weedy species, but it goes from seed to seed in something like three weeks. Okay? So anyways, interesting, right? So it's sort of like a fruit fly. Yeah, exactly. So the fruit fly of the, of the biology world, right? Okay. So leaves, okay, there are things that affect leaf size and leaf color, all right? And that is really the intensity of the light, okay? Um, also, it's genetic code, okay? This would be great if we had a really good genes in it to keep it small, okay? And, this, and then also it, there are hormones that affect the size of the leaf, okay? And then light, light's a big thing. Light's really one of the things that we can only, the only thing we can control, believe it or not. Okay? We can give it more light, we can give it less light. Okay? We can give it light for a longer period of the day, we can give it light for less time in the day. Okay? So we can give it a better quality light, we can give it more light. Um, so this is really the only thing we can control. There are some hormones out there. Okay? There's one that's called Trinzapac ethyl. It's Primo Max, it's very expensive. Okay? And they use it on grass grass all the time, um, golf course putting greens, that suppresses um, seed growth and also leaf growth, and it stunts the, the plant, okay? Keeps a very tight, um, uniform plane surface, right? And I'm sure you could use that same hormone, um, the growth regulator, on um, trees as well, but I don't know what the long-term effect may be. I was gonna say, what's the long-term yeah. effect? Yeah, maybe you, well, yeah, that's the thing. It kind of wears off after about four weeks. You got to put it down again. And who knows, if you keep doing that on a tree, maybe three, four years, it declines and it dies on you. Similar to like pinching a tree too much, cutting off its foliage too much. Maybe it's, I don't know. So I've never done that, okay? But I'm sure in Japan, they've probably experimented with different growth regulators. Yeah. All right, any questions about, about that? Is that interesting? Is that groundbreaking? Maybe not groundbreaking, but we haven't heard much of that, right? You hear, oh, this one needs full sun, this one needs shade. Well, um, why? Why does it need shade? Why does it need full sun? Okay. There are times when I have conifers in full shade, maybe only for about a week after I've done certain work, but you have to understand that effect that light has on these plants. Here's a little picture. Uh, this is all from the same tree. Okay. And so this is a little bit, a little bit of everything, right? So a little bit of vigor a little bit of light quality, okay? But this is taken at the base of the tree, okay? This is about midway, and then this is at the very top, the apex of a redwood, okay? In nature, right? And so you can see there's still, you know, these are the, there's apical buds here, right? So this is the end of the bud, so there's some, there's some hormone there, but that light is affecting it, okay? And probably a lack of certain hormones, right? And then you get a little bit more light, a little bit, more or less hormones, you get a different response. And then at the very, very top of the tree, if any of you have, I've never had this opportunity, but I've seen pictures. Um, if you've had the opportunity to go to the top of a redwood in, you know, in nature, many of the leaves, it looks kind of like um, giant sequoia foliage, okay? And I'm not sure why, maybe it's because, yeah, okay. Okay, the leaves down below uh -huh. are the ones that are reaching out for the light. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Are actually collecting all the fog and the moisture and the nutrients that come in here. Interesting. Yeah, so there, there's multiple you know, benefits of that. So it's kind of shaped a certain way so it can actually bring in some of that moisture. And then when that moisture hits the leaf, it goes straight down. It's kind of interesting because there's little arrows, right? But yeah, there's a lot of responses for that, right? But also it has, um, they're probably photosynthesizing as well, but when you're 300 feet in the, in the air, I mean, there's a lot of light up there, and there's very little shade. They don't have to fight for light. They got it. And so they don't have to develop a leaf that looks like this. They can develop a leaf that looks like that, that has other benefits, maybe collecting water, or, or not only collecting water, but just allowing water to not stay up top and just get down very quickly, okay? 
So very interesting. So this is what I call leaf acclimation, right? All in one tree, all happening during a season, okay, for multiple reasons. Okay. I don't know. Yeah, I don't know. I don't think oh, I don't. Where they can reach the fog, they have the light. Right. I don't know if that would be enough of a difference for them oh. to get really tight foliage, right? But the more compact you keep them, if you keep them well fertilized, um, the smaller their foliage can get, right? It's not going to get like this, okay? But it can be like this versus something like this, right? Um, the other thing is there is some genetics that play a role in this. And if you guys have been around a lot of redwoods, you'll see there's some redwoods that just, their foliage is more like this all the time. I had one and, um, and sold that, but uh, some, of, some of those redwoods just grow like that, okay? And it's just, some are a little bit more blue, some are more green, okay? And um, this happens also with Rocky Mountain junipers. It's the most widespread juniper in North America besides the common juniper. Uh, but common juniper has a needle-like foliage, so it really just kind of looks the same all the time. But Rocky Mountain junipers have so many different types of foliage. Some that tend to weep, some that are very tight, some that are kind of bunchy, kind of clumpy like uh, kishu, some that are even finer than Itoigawa, some that are blue, some that are lime green, some that are really vibrant green like the one that I showed you the other day. Okay? And then those will change when you bring them down from the mountain. Okay? It's really interesting. So there's lots of acclimation that can happen within the lifetime of the tree. Okay? All right. Uh, is this a repeat? Oh, okay. This is a little bit more here. Okay? So we, we've seen this happen on trees. We talk about sunburn, right? Well, what is sunburn? Very similar to what happens to us, okay? The ultraviolet rays, there's so much energy, it burns our skin, right? Okay, well, really, it's just damaging our skin cells. Well, the same thing happens with plants. Once that light becomes so intense and there's enough exposure, okay, it can actually degrade the, um, the photoreceptors in the... Uh, um, the tissue, and then the cells will actually break down, okay? And that has, does a lot of damage. A lot of uh, herbicides, okay, that are really, really effective, they actually, what they do is they will block the synthesis of certain beta carotenes that are utilized in protecting the photoreceptors of the cells. And then when they block, when it blocks that beta carotene, there's no longer this protective molecule and then the light comes in and it damages the, um, the photosynthesis and it literally bleaches the plant out. And then when it's white and bleached out, it's no longer absorbing the energy and then it burns, okay? So that's how certain herbicides work, all right? Um, which one? Tenacity is like that. That's a one that's used on turf grass. Uh, but anyway, so this is very important to understand, right? And how do plants manage that? Well, they manage it by developing a cuticle layer. Okay, so now if they've developed their cuticle layer in a shady condition and you put them out in the sun, boom, okay. Now, they, if it's hot, that cuticle layer is not thick enough to keep out that light that their chlorophyll molecules are used, are used to adapt or, or, or receiving, okay. So that's probably, if we had to move something out into the, into the sun, that's probably where we would use something like cloud cover or Antistress 2000, right? Okay. All right. And then what uh, Rick said, light generates heat. This is another thing, okay? So there's some thermal damage that can actually happen. This is um, speculated. One of the reasons why um, coast redwoods do so poorly down in Southern California, uh, number one, uh, poor water quality or just salts in the soils, okay, by constant irrigation and evaporation and all that salt building up in there. And the other one is actually um, thermal damage, okay? And why does this happen is because they thought maybe that, um, there's a paper on it, it's really interesting if you guys wanted to want to look at it. It's kind of technical jargon, but long story short, they, the thought was that, well, um, basically redwoods, when it gets so hot, their roots basically can't keep up with the heat 
and they're not cooling themselves off enough, and, and maybe it's just, you know, they, their leaves burn because there's not enough moisture up there, right? And so they've actually, um, there's some studies that they've done and they've actually taken, I think there's one in the Fullerton Arboretum where they have these uh, basically posts that go up 30, 40 feet in the air and they have misters on them and they're still getting dieback, right? And they're like, well, what the heck? Because they're trying to keep moisture around them. Well, um, I think what they're realizing it is now, it's not that uh, redwoods can't you know, keep up with the heat um, or redwoods can't endure the heat. They actually can, right? But what happens is when they receive heat, redwoods will close their stomata. They're really good at this, much better than most other plants. That was the thought. They can't close their stomata and therefore they can't, you know, um, shuttle enough water out of their stomata and they're burning their leaves up, right? Well, that's not the case. Redwoods actually close their stomata up very, very well, almost too good. And then when you're down in Southern California, you get 110 degree days or 105 degree days or, you know, a month of 90 degree days, whatever it is, they're thinking that there is thermal damage that's happening because it's actually not cooling itself off. And so it's just the leaves heating up and heating up and heating up and then it cooks itself and then it dies off. There are. They just don't look like it. Redwoods, coastal redwoods, yeah. So when you couple that thermal damage with salt, all right? So there's there's more water, there's more rainfall in Sacramento, so there's better water quality and better soil conditions in Sacramento than Southern California. That's what I think. Oh yeah, there's a lot of exactly. So although there's all that, heat, that's what I when I moved to Sacramento, which was just a couple months ago. Um, I was like, man, how do they have, it's 106 degrees right now, and there's a redwood right here, and it's totally fine. Well, you know, I think that's, I think that's what it is. I mean, there's enough moisture in the soil. Well, if the moisture in the soil, if the soil is clean enough, if there's not as many, not as many salts in the soil or sodium, then they're fine, okay? And then the other thing is really interesting is I have a client who's on a golf course, and he has a redwood that's right here and then there's a fence where that wall is and there's a redwood on the other side of it. That redwood is beautiful, lush redwood and his is just completely struggling and dying. And I said, what's the deal? He's like, well this one's, I'm irrigating it and the other one, the, the homeowners, homeowners irrigating it. <laughs> gophers, yeah. Uh, maybe, maybe it's gophers. Well, yeah, golf oh golf course. I, they said gophers. I was like, yeah, maybe gophers, yeah. Golf course. Well, what, it, what I found out was the resident over here, they have municipal potable water, right? And then he has reclaimed water mixed with delta water. Too much salt, that's what it is. And so we, I got him on a program where we're pounding it with gypsum and then we got this other product we're gonna use and just irrigate heavily and hopefully we get a rain and to keep him alive. But yeah, long term it's just not gonna work out. But the homeowner has good water quality and it's doing fine, right? And that's over there in, in Brentwood, Antioch area. Okay, so pretty warm still. All right, any questions about that? So yeah, thermal damage, heat from light, okay? A lot of these concepts, so now I'm just kind of, I, I just jotted down basically what we've said. Um, I did this uh, before, but uh, anyway, so um, just a couple things to remember. Light intensity will change throughout the year, right? So the amount of light, you know, the day length, things like that. Okay, um, and this can result in sunburn for certain plants, especially the ones that haven't adapted to that amount of sunlight, okay? If you take a tree and you put it in a certain area and it, you keep it there all year long, you're probably not gonna run into as big of problems, right? So that's why landscape trees do okay. You still see some sunburn, but, um, but the good thing about you know, bonsai trees and the bad thing is well, they're in pots and we can move them. Well, sometimes we move them into the wrong spot, not good. But other times we can move them into a better spot, a better location especially if they've experienced some kind of stress from whatever it may be, okay? Um, so sunburn and light intensity is the most damaging to plants when we move locations. That may be moving from Gordon's garden to my garden or someone else's or maybe within your own garden. So that's important to know, okay? So that's something that, that I'm always concerned with as I you know, sell trees and things like that. I tell the person, hey, this is coming from full sun or this is coming from full sun, but it's gonna take a week to get to you, it's gonna be in a box and full like darkness, no sun. So be mindful of that and bring it out into the sun slowly, okay? Okay, so um, 
Sunburn, although it looks really bad on deciduous trees, it's more detrimental to conifers. Okay? It's, so deciduous trees, yes, you'll burn off their leaves, but they'll put them back. Conifer, you burn off all the foliage, it's going to be a long time before it comes back. Okay, so that's very important. They're, they're very slow going, um, and so they don't like to do anything very fast. Okay, most conifers. All right, so um, consider day length. Okay, this can be damaging, but it can also be an indicator for dormancy oh, and for flowering as well. Okay, so the amount of sunlight that a certain tree gets, okay, can affect, you know, if it's going to go into dormancy quickly or slowly. Um, the fact of the matter is light bends, light moves, okay? That's why when we're in full shade, we can still see perfectly fine. Well, it's because all of that far red light and some of the red light is bending around and we can actually see. Okay, so um, it's important to kind of keep that in mind. The plant's gonna know how long the day is regardless of where we put it, but we can kind of curb it one side or the other by the amount of light we allow it to get, okay? Um, also, day length um, is, is an indicator for dormancy, and we'll talk about that in this next slide. Okay. Um, so there's something that plants have, and it's a way that they detect light. So how do they know, right? Okay, how do they know what light that they're getting? There's something called the phytochrome complex. There's other complexes as well that will dictate or will tell them how much light they're getting and how much light they're not getting. So the phytochrome complex, phytochrome is a pigment. Okay, and it comes in two forms. It comes in a red form and a far red form. But the pigment complex, it's the same pigment. And depending on what type of light it receives, it either turns to phytochrome red or to phytochrome far red. So I'm not going to get into it entirely, but basically, depending on the light it receives, it switches from one form to the other. All right? And then the plant determines the quality of light basically on the concentration of one form or the other. If it has a lot of this one concentration of the phytochrome complex, then it goes, oh, we're getting a lot of light. If it has a very low concentration of that and a higher concentration of the other form, it's thinking, oh, it's starting to turn into fall and we're going to go into dormancy. Okay. Things are going to start to shift. Days are going to get colder. I better start shedding my leaves or doing what I need to do to get ready for the winter. Okay. So plants have a way to detect that. Okay. And that the phytochrome pigment complex is kind of the number one thing. All right, this causes plants to become etiolated, okay, or the leaves to stretch and to get longer. When plants are trying to stretch out their leaves and they're getting long, kind of big, or their branches are getting longer, this is because of this phytochrome complex. That plant, that branch or that leaf knows, that branch knows, hey, I'm getting light, but I'm not getting a high quality of light. And so, th so that signal, so basically it can tell that from this phytochrome complex, that signals it to do a certain thing and it allows it to actually stretch and elongate more. So your longer branches just aren't longer because they're, they're composed of more cells or they're growing farther. They're longer sometimes because their cells physically elongate, okay? So one cell that's maybe, you know, you know one-tenth of a millimeter thick, now it becomes a millimeter long, okay, or two millimeters long, it can do that. So um, that's pretty interesting. And you'll see that in seedlings when they actually bend toward light. That's actually because of blue light and then a certain hormone concentration, but anyway, that's called acid, acid cell growth, okay, and what it'll do is basically wherever it's receiving the blue light, it will shift hormones to one side of the, of the, of the stem. Those cells will elongate, so now if you have small cells, and long cells on the same stem, you get a bending leaf or a bending branch, and it goes that way, okay? Pretty interesting stuff. All right, so this phytochrome um, pigment, basically this tells a plant, hey, am I in too much shade? Do I need to grow faster and elongate more, or am I in the right amount of light and I can just stay nice and squat and tight, okay? So this is that complex that does that. It also, um, does it for seeds, okay, for germination. So basically, what does this do? It basically tells the plant what's the quality of light and what's the quantity of light. How long are the days and how good is the light that I'm receiving? And how do I need to respond to change that, okay? Are these phytochrome pigment complex, are they like in the stomata? Are they they're actually just in the, in the um, they're all over the plant, actually. All over the plant, yeah. 
So they're in the leaves, they're in the stems, and wherever that the plant can receive that. The light quality that it receives, okay, determines a lot of things. So basically what the plant perceives, okay, through this complex will determine how it's gonna grow, if it's going to continue growing or slow down its growth, if it's gonna flower, or if it's going to say, I am super stressed out, can't take it any longer, and start to do something different, okay? So this is very important. So light will determine all of that, those things, okay? Um, so that's good too. All right, any questions on that? So this is kind of powerful information and it may take a little time for you to kind of let it soak in and then go, oh, well, that's why this happens in the garden or oh, I can, this tree, maybe I pruned it a little bit too late and I want it to get some more growth. Let's get it in full sun for a longer period of time or something like that, you know? So you may be able to take this information back home and change some of your practices, right? Okay. And you, you may not realize it now, but maybe in a month, in a year or something like that. Let's quickly touch on temperature. Okay, temperature can be a good or it can be a bad thing, right? Um, it could be a good thing because it will help our plants come out of dormancy, okay? It could be a good thing because it could help our plants go into a full dormancy. If it's nice and cold, some plants need that, okay? Going into a full dormancy is a lot better than going into a kind of a partial dormancy. Sometimes you'll see landscape plants, especially like fruit trees and things like that, they'll put out leaves before they flower, when on a normal year they should flower before they put out leaves, something like that. And that's basically because they don't get a real finite dormancy period. They kind of get this weird warm winter, okay? Kind of confuses them. All right, so temperature really determines the metabolic activity in the plant. The higher the temperature, okay, the faster that those biochemical processes are gonna take place, okay? But if it's too high, they'll shut down. If it's too cold, they'll shut down as well, as we talked about yesterday, all right? The other thing that we, uh, Rick and I kind of talked about and Janet yesterday is this also determines your microbiological activity um, within the soil, the temperature. The warmer it is, the more active it's gonna be. If it gets too hot, I mean, for lack of a better term, we can cook the, the soil and then everything shuts down, okay? And it takes a while for it to come back, all right? Okay, so let's talk about this a little bit. And this is, this is a topic that I touched on a lot of times with people that were trying to grow redwoods in Southern California as bonsai, which it can be done, but you're walking on a very fine line. If you make a wrong move, you lose a tree, okay? Here, you make a wrong move, maybe you lose a branch, you lose some foliage, okay? Southern California, you lose a tree. Okay, so I talked about this a lot. So high temperatures, redwoods can take 110 degrees, right? But you couple high temperatures with high light, and maybe bad soil conditions or bad water, they're done, okay? So when you look at one particular factor, whether it's light, whether it's temperature, that isn't the killer, right? But you put in light and temperature and maybe a disease or something like that or some moisture, whatever, now it becomes very complex and you have this, this other monster you have to deal with, okay? So in general, uh, for me, high temperatures and high light is kind of a disaster, all right? I do not like that. So like out in the garden today, if this was my garden, not saying you guys should be stressed out, but I'd be super stressed out out there, okay? Because I do not like the way it feels out in that garden, okay? Maybe it's just me. It's, you know, I don't like the heat, and so I feel like the plants don't. Well, the junipers can hack it, and even some of the pines, but, yeah, it's just not a good deal, Okay. Um, so obviously your deciduous trees are the most sensitive. Uh, we, Kathy and I were talking about this and um, Gary, there's a Japanese maple out there that was defoliated um, a few yeah, weeks ago. Awesome. Yeah, and probably repotted. And it's taking some time to put on new leaves. Well, it's a very hot day, yesterday and today, and it has no leaves and just bare branches. Okay, those branches are not used to all that sun and heat. Okay, so now you can probably get some sunburn on it. You might lose some branches. So as Kathy and I were talking about, it may be a good deal to put it in the shade for a little while until it starts to bud back and then put it back out. Yeah, yeah. Okay, which is a good deal. But so you see kind of how this, this plays into the way we do things. Okay, most conifers, it's okay. Right? Most conifers, it's okay. As long as their root systems are protected, right? They can handle it. Some of them have a thick bark. Okay, they have a very thick cuticle layer. They have a very, a, a narrow leaf, 
very tight leaves, and so that allows water and air and light to be deflected really well. Okay? So pines, they actually increase their photosynthetic activity and decrease the stress that they receive by having a short a, a needle. Right? So that needle allows light to pass by it. They can pick up light, but let light get to the other needles. But they can also deflect some of that sun. I don't know if you guys have seen wisteria. Certain times of the day, wisteria, especially right now, if you have a wisteria out there, you'll see it. And the leaves will go and try to stay just to get out of the sun, right? And that's because if they can get out of some of that sun, they can reduce some of that heat as well. Okay. All right, so what is the threshold, right? What's that threshold? Well, for me personally, the threshold is any time it gets over 75 degrees, I'm, you know, in Southern California, if I had a deciduous tree, which I didn't have very many, I'm trying to put them in, in kind of shape cloth. Some, some percentage of shade cloth, right? Um, and for conifers, when it gets over 90 degrees, I'm putting them in shade cloth. Shade cloth, okay? All right, so now that we're on the topic of shade cloth, let's talk about that. And this is, I was already gonna talk about it, but this is uh, Kathy's request to remind us today about this. All right, not all shade cloths are created equal. Not all shade cloths are created equal. Why? Um, because they don't, they're not all designed for the same purpose, okay? So, um, like I said uh, before, some of the shade cloth that you get in some of these different patio type places and um, you know Home Depot and Lowe's, things like that, uh, they're designed for humans, right? So they want to block out the most amount of light but still let some light come in so that you can actually see and it doesn't feel like you're in the complete shade. Well, they block out something like 75 to 80% of light. Well, that light has that photosynthes photosynthetically active radiation that the plants need. So 80%, that's way too much light to be blocking out for, for good plant growth, especially for conifers, especially for conifers. For broadleaf trees, I still think it's too much. Okay, so what can we do? All right, this is kind of my, my range. This will change for everyone in different areas, maybe in your garden or whatnot, but this is kind of what I like here. Okay, I'm looking at something between 50 to 60% maximum, maximum for deciduous trees, okay? 30 to 40% maximum for conifers, all right? And that's the maximum. Right? Anything more than that, I start to get spider mites. I start to get fungus. I start to get weird growth, okay? Why is that? Well, because they're not getting enough light. They're not staying vigorous enough and healthy enough because of the lack of light, okay? So that's kind of where I like to be, okay? But that can change for you guys, okay? All right, another thing that I like, I like, oh yeah, Gordon. Uh -huh. So the shade cloths that we're using out yes. there, that, that's, you know, uh, Home Depot. Right. The shade cloth uh -huh. says it's 75%, so there's no way. Okay. Uh, the color of the shade cloth you buy from these yep. stores makes a difference in how much light goes through. Yeah, definitely. For a lifetime tan, mm -hmm. uh, there's no way. I don't know what it's cutting out, but I doubt it. You doubt it's cutting out 75? Yeah. Okay. Uh, yeah. Maybe Right. You just with a camera. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. One stop right. Well, that's interesting because I'm not sure if cameras perceive light the same way that plants do. Okay. But what's what's very interesting to me um, when I was in grad school and I was doing studies, I had this study. I don't know if I've told you guys this before, but I was basically measuring photosynthesis in the grass, right? And so what I would do is I had this. We made this tent basically out of like. Um, a translucent material, basically just like a plastic similar to this, but a little bit more clear. And then I had this little tripod and a little meter in there. And what it did is, it, and I had a fan. And what I would do is I would take this little tripod with my little meter on there and I had this big tent that was one meter by one meter squared, or as a cube, and I'd put it over the top. And then I'd stay away from the sun, so let the sun come down into it. Um, and then I would measure how much photosynthesis was taking place. How did we do that? We basically measured, because we were in a closed system, we could measure the amount of moisture in the air and the amount of carbon dioxide. And that was fun because I could see it on my laptop. I could, there was a little graph and it would just show me. It would have a certain percentage of water in the air and then a certain percentage of carbon dioxide. And I would just watch it over a 90 second period and you'd see the carbon dioxide decline and the air and the water. And so the, the, the graphs would just literally like this whoosh, and cross over each other. So what was it telling me? It was saying that, oh, the plants were using up the carbon dioxide for photosynthesis, and then they were putting out more water because they were opening their stomatas to get the carbon dioxide, and they're letting water out through their stomata. Very cool thing. 
Well, I also had a PAR meter, a PAR meter on there, and I had to wait. I had to make sure that that was at 2,000 before I could actually take a reading on the plants. And I had to make sure that it was the same for each one. So on a partly cloudy day, super bright, I could still barely see outside because it was so bright. Um, I would, a, sh a little cloud would come over and just block the sun a little bit. I couldn't even tell with my, with my eyes. And the PAR would go from 2,000 to 900 instantly. It was incredible, right? So the only thing I learned from that is, man, my eyes cannot tell <laughs> what plants can tell. Because I, I just like, well, I couldn't even, I didn't even notice it. And, and the only reason I found out about that is because I took my readings for like a week. And then I went back and I was trying to analyze them. I went to my professor and I said, hey, there's nothing going on. There's, everything's all off the charts. And he's like, well, how sunny is it? I said, I didn't even look. It was just, it's 100 degrees outside. He's like, well, watch the clouds. And so I thought, oh, dang. You know, and so I had to do that. And that made it more difficult. But that's what I did learn. So even though it, it, the color definitely, I think it makes a difference, right? Especially for, for us. But I think the color plays a different role for plants, OK? And it's not for light transmission. I think light transmission is just whatever's there, it kind of blocks out that light. So um, I don't know. Maybe we'd have to get a different meter. But that, what I do know is I've seen less growth out of those, um, out of that type of um, you know, material from Home Depot or Lowe's. Okay. Um, what I, and what I use, okay, and we'll go into this, is called Illuminate. Okay. And Illuminate, like I said, has that aluminum feature. And what it does, it actually, it lets in quite a bit of light, but it reflects the light back. And I kid you not, you can kind of feel it over here when you step into that shade cloth. It's a little cooler, right? But it doesn't feel cooler. It's the heat back. Yeah. Not the light. Exactly. So a luminette reflects, well, it reflects the light that it's blocking out. So let's say you get a luminette and it says it's 40%. That means that 60% of the light's coming in. Well, what's happening to that other 40%? On another shade cloth, the other 40% is absorbed into the shade cloth. And then eventually it radiates down. Okay? It's just like radiant heat. Right? And you can feel it. If you put your hand closer to the shade cloth, you can feel the heat. And as the day creeps on, it radiates down. Right? So now you've got a plant. It's in very little light. And it's in very, a lot of heat. So it's not photosynthesizing. And it's a lot of heat. Just kind of stressing out. So. But with the Luminette, you can put your hand right underneath where the shade cloth is. It feels exactly the same all the way through. And I think it's because the light that it's not letting through, it's bouncing it back. And it's radiating it back up the instead of back down. Yeah, the heat, right. Well, the light that it's not letting through is, is letting the heat that comes with the light back up. It's, it's, it's reflecting the heat back, too, as well. Is the material shining like a mirror? It is. It is shining. Like a it's like aluminum foil. Yeah, like aluminum foil. Yep. Mm -hmm. It is on both sides, um, but you don't really tell on the underside. Yeah. So. That is a disadvantage. It's more expensive, okay, um, than other shade cloths. It's not as durable as some of these other shade cloths, okay. And meaning, what does that mean? It will take the UV rays, no problem but it does not take a sloppy hand very well. A couple times I caught it, and it kind of goes a little bit, okay? But my shade cloth did really well. I had it for about three years, and now I just, it's in a box, okay? But what it does, it's just, it's kind of a, it's just not as durable of a material, so you have to be a little bit more careful with it, and that's it, okay? Um, but the benefits that you get from it, I think, are a lot better. I don't know exactly what the pricing is, but there's a couple places online that carry it. Greenhouse Mega Store, okay. Greenhouse Mega Store seems to be the, the most cost effective, okay. And then there's other places, right? But you can get it in. I think you can get it in ten percent. The the um, the lighter or the more transmission. So like if you get a ten percent, it's a lot more delicate because it's just like this big net, right? A thirty percent, so you can get it in ten, thirty, forty, fifty, sixty, and eighty, right? So I I like to use it in that 30 to 60 range. So I'll use 30% on my conifers, and I'll use 60% on my deciduous trees. OK. 70% is running 23 cents a square foot. OK. And then also, how much square foot? 23 cents? A square foot. what percentage? That's a 70, so it's Right, so the cheap, the, the, if you get a 40%, it's going to be, should be cheaper, just a little bit, or maybe same price. But what you can do is you can buy it in a bulk roll, 
um, if it has, if you have the means to cut it and then, you know, bind the edges up. Ah, does it allow airflow? Okay. It doesn't allow any more airflow than another comparable shade cloth. How do we get airflow underneath our shade cloth? What do you want in the, in the fences over there? Yeah. You got to, so you got to have it high enough up, okay, above the trees so that you get airflow, okay. Well, if you have it above, plenty above the trees, but you have a fence right next to there, I mean, you're not going to get as much airflow, okay? But you don't want to have it really low over the trees. You want a good amount of airflow to happen, okay? So that's going to help to cool, and it's also going to help to allow CO2 to come through and the plants to continue to photosynthesize, okay? Um, what I like to do, what I say here, is that having easily removable, I want something that I could put on a little bit of a pulley system and then open and close because in my garden, when I get a cloudy day, I don't care if it's August. It's overcast, I pull the shade cloth off. And why? That lets more air go through, all that stuff, because if it's warm and it's overcast, high humidity equals disease and all that stuff. So I like to have something that I can adjust on the fly very quickly. Boom, boom, boom. Ideally, you know, they have greenhouses. Ideally, I would have a meter on there that detects how much light's coming through and it automatically pulls back and, and goes forward. And they have those on commercial greenhouses, but that's not going to happen for me. Yeah, Kathy. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Right. Exactly. Yep. Right. I should almost That's look that up. The, yeah. yeah. But uh, anyways, uh, Bjorn has a video and it shows his shade cloth at the garden. Very good system. I liked it. So I'm going to model my next system after that. So he has basically over the garden, they have every eight feet or six feet, or maybe it's five feet, they just have vertical cables running. And then he can pull. So let's say he only wants shade on 40% of his garden. He can pull this one, this one, this one, this one. And then the other one, he can open it up, right? And the other thing is at night, when you want it to cool off, you can, you can open it up instead of leaving all that heat inside. And now it's more moisture, still a lot of heat, a lot of disease, you want it to be able to open up and cool off, right? Okay, so that's kind of important, right? Um, if you didn't, if for some reason your budget didn't allow you going with a light color is a lot better than a black, okay? You're gonna, it's gonna absorb less heat, all right? But this is kind of the things to consider with shade cloth. At least that's kind of my goal, right? But, and anyone that has been in my garden, which no one here has, which is not my garden anymore, it's someone else's, um, can attest to that how much cooler it was underneath the aluminate shade cloth versus another shade cloth. Okay. All right. Any questions on shade cloth? Yeah. So what you guys have here, you could just take those and you can modify those. Um, but I don't know, because it looks like when I was here in uh, January, you had those off. Yeah. You guys just kind of pulled the whole panel off. Yeah. And that's yeah. something you can do as well. Yeah. It's two ladders and two people. Yeah. Well, it takes one Gordon and two people to do it. Yeah. <laughs> so, um, but yeah, I mean, you could just take the luminette and put it on to those that you have already and do the same thing. Or, but I think if you're going to invest, I mean, I would, I'd love to see just, not that I want to see this, but I'd love to see um, a shade cloth over that whole garden today. That'd be great. A retractable one. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. A retractable one. Yeah. Stretch it all. Okay. Um, airflow, very important when you have um, high heat and shade. Okay. So, um, and I was thinking, I don't know, I'm sure you guys have plenty of ideas, but if you wanted to open up some of that fence or whatever, um, maybe you make a little trap door on it and you can just open the door and the door hangs down like this and then you get this like little vision panel that opens up. And then if you don't want people sticking their arms in at night, you just close it. Yeah. Well, you could put a screen, but someone could put a knife through it. Uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and then it becomes a bone size zoo, right? It looks like a jail, yeah. It could. All right. Um, 
Just kind of quickly wanted to touch on dormancy because I probably won't, uh, I'll see you guys before we get into dormancy, but not in this setting here. But um, what is dormancy? Okay, so dormancy kind of happens with, um, in multiple situations, okay? Um, unfortunately, this is the area where we could probably talk a lot more about, but we don't have a lot of time. But what is dormancy? It's really just a state of inactivity or latent growth, okay? So meaning things just aren't growing. Um, uh, some people can say, oh, that's dead. But whatever, no, but dormant, right? Okay, why do plants go dormant? Several reasons, okay? We talked about light. They perceive the light, and they also can perceive the temperature as well, okay? So temperature and light changes, right? Do tropical plants in their native environment go dormant? No, why? Why? What happens in a tropical environment? Yeah, warm and sunny in July and warm and sunny in December, right? Okay. doesn't change. So there's no point to go in dormant, right? I love it when people say, hey, it's pineapple season. Pineapples are on sale. Like, what are you talking about, man? Pineapple season <laughs> is all the time. Pineapples only on sale is because people didn't buy it last month. That's why. It's a supply and demand thing, right? Same thing with avocados. Well, let's change the avocados because we have them in, in Southern California. They have a little bit of season to them, right? Because of that. So anyway, so temperature and light make a difference, right? So the climate in which plants grow has determined this. And this is an adaptation thing, okay? Something that's, deter that's been determined over, you know, several generations. So this is why plants go dormant, okay? So you can do something about that. I had a few um, ponderosa pines in Southern California for a few years. Um, some of them did well for the first two years and then they declined and died. They didn't get a, a cool enough winter. Well, the ones that I really um, wanted to keep around, uh, which actually ended up selling. I put them in my mom's flower shop cooler for eight, eight weeks out of, this, out of the winter. Totally fine. So that's something you can do, right? Because the light was fine. They were, you know, they were actually in a window, and so they were getting light. They didn't need a lot of light because they weren't photosynthesizing more, but it was 37 degrees in there and continuously, which was, which was not bad. Some of these plants, uh, especially deciduous trees, they lose their leaves, and so it doesn't matter if there's no light, all right? And then other, you know, conifers, they may be under snow during that time of the year, and they don't perceive light either, okay? So, so that's not a bad thing, okay? This is what I wanted to just touch on a little bit, and this is kind of a sensitive subject for, um, for people because they all have different opinions on this. But there are also periods, so this is not an opinion, this is an opinion here, but there are peri periods of latent growth or what I call mild dormancy during the growing season, okay? And that is what should dictate what we do to plants and when. When we should, you know, prune, when we should style, when we should do major bending, whatever it is, okay? But some examples is, oh, when we graft, when we do major bending, okay? The goal, I think, should be to shoot for either this period of dormancy or the period when they're not dormant, when they're really actively growing, okay? So, um, you know, one thing that I've been taught, one thing I like to do is when I am defining the live vein and working the shari, I like them to be actively growing, okay? Because then I could see the live vein a little bit more, right? Um, but when I'm working on a juniper, I don't want it to be actively growing when I'm making a major bend, okay? That's very dangerous because now the cambium can separate from the wood and that's a problem. So what does that mean? Does that mean that you do major bending in the fall or the winter? Maybe. Does that mean you do major bending in another time of the year when it's just the growth has slowed down? Maybe, okay. So what is this mild dormancy? Okay, for in Southern California, for us, it happened in August, okay? Probably July 15th to about August 31st. It was so freaking hot, nothing was happening. The trees were just like, just get me the heck out of here and nothing happened. Well, everything we put on their growth before, and then as soon as September came around, they'd start putting on more growth. So they kind of stop, right? And I know that they're stopping. Okay, good, we're good to go. And so I could do um, major bending. That's the, the, the perfect time for me to do major bending and work on junipers, okay? The fall was the worst time for me to do work on junipers. And it was because of the Santa Ana winds that I would get. So I'd do a major bend on a tree, boom, okay. Well now, I've done some damage to it and it's not repairing until the spring comes along. Well, what happens the whole winter down in Southern California? 30 mile an hour winds every weekend, just and then that starts to dry out the branch and then it dies in the spring, okay? So for me, it was better to bend 
during that short period of dormancy during the summer when plants are they're still alive they're still growing but not growing actively and then in the fall um, they would start to grow more they could repair some of the damage I did to them and they were okay during the winter winds right so anyway so this is important to consider and this will change for everywhere you are and then every type of tree right okay so it's gonna be different for pines different for junipers things like that you still want to have great aftercare um, but yeah, if you're doing them in the winter, especially if it gets a little bit colder, or for me, if I had a better protection system, like a greenhouse, I would have just put them in the greenhouse. It would have been fine, right? This topic is interesting. Health, right? Okay. So uh, Ryan Neal calls this ultimate health. I've heard others just call it um, like health versus like vigor. Um, and I've called it like true health. But we can just call it health in general, okay? How do we know a tree is healthy? What is health for a tree? What is that? What does it look like? You know it when you see it. Yeah, you know it when you see it, but you can't put your tongue on it, right? Okay. It's green, it's lush, okay. Right. Okay. Good. Yeah, good form. Yeah, good shape. Right. Looks healthy, looks robust, okay. So yeah, all right, so um, in the horticulture world and especially in the, uh, the grass growing world, so golf and, and athletic sports turf, things like that, uh, for many, many years it was just pump them with synthetic fertilizers. They're just grasses, whatever, get them going, get them green, that's great. Well, they're starting to realize over the last probably five to seven years there's a lot more problems with them, right? They get more disease, they get more stress, all this other stuff, and they're pumping them with fertilizer and they're also pumping insecticides on and fungicides on and all this stuff, and they're still not getting the results that they want. Well, um, take a few steps back, actually several centuries back, okay, when we had different types of fertilizers, lots of organic fertilizers, and then there's actually, um, a lot of actually in in Ireland and other parts of the world where they're coastal areas a lot of the farmers there used to take and harvest kelp okay and they would kind of process that kelp in a sludge and then they would put it out over their crops okay salt. yeah there is salt right so you have to kind of rinse it and process it right but they would take that kelp and then they would use that and then there was something in the kelp there was hormones but there was also biological activity that st stimulated the soil okay Huh? There is some iron, but not too much, right? But then there's other, so that's just one example, but there's other things like, you know, different, you know, animal manures, uh, and then also other things, okay? Um, and so people started to look more into this, and it's the same thing in the medical field. Now we have this, uh, we have a growing uh, kind of awareness of holistic medicine. It's not just about what pill makes us feel better, it's about, hey, Okay, and Kaiser is really big on promoting this, you know, good physical activity, you know, whether it's listening to good music that makes us feel good, spending time with friends, laughing, all this stuff. I saw, there's this one billboard if you come from the Bay into Davis, and it's a picture of a woman in probably her mid-70s, and she's got a swim cap on, and, she's, and it says, if I rest, I rest, right? It's kind of, a, kind of a really cool thing. But I'm not saying that Kaiser's got it going on, but you see there's, there's this heightened awareness of, hey, it's not just about medicine, it's about how do we look at life entirely and how do we, you know, achieve what we want, which is ultimate health. Well, the plant and horticulture world is the same way. We're starting to realize that now, that there's a lot more things that happen that we don't attribute um, uh, success to, okay? And so, and this is kind of it. So, um, health, in, at least in the you know, grass wool is, hey, it looks green, it looks lush, it's great, it's fine, okay? Well, you leave on a Friday, you come back on a Monday, and it's lit up. Your green is half dead. What happened? Okay, sunburn. it could have been disease, it could have been sunburn. Oh, my pump broke on Saturday morning, and we had 100 degree temps on Sunday, and I didn't know, and I came back on Monday, it didn't irrigate for 48 hours. Goodness gracious, it's dead, right? Okay, so it doesn't necessarily, that, that's not what, I think health should be, right? Just because I missed dinner last night shouldn't mean that I'm in the hospital in the morning. That's not okay, right? If I'm really healthy, if I missed 
every meal yesterday, I should be okay today. Yeah, I'm hungry, but I should be fine, okay? So um, that is kind of what I want for health. Is that really where we can get? I don't know, but that's kind of what I think of health. So that's kind of this ultimate health, this true health. How healthy are our trees? Yeah, it's green, it's lush right now. Yeah, there's a certain level of tolerance and resiliency that we need in our trees to really be able to say that they're really healthy, okay? So um, what is that true health? And I think it's that, okay? So what would it consist of? If you were to say, hey, if you could determine and you can make a list of this is a healthy tree, what would that consist of? What would true health really be for a bonsai tree? Yeah. Okay, so we already have, we want it to look lush, we want it to look green, to the leaves not to be deformed, to be very classical in shape. We want the trees to have all those physical appearances. Yes, what else would we want? The it's a wish list. Stored strength. Okay, stored strength for what? Um, to withstand the, the daily ups and downs. Okay, all right. Okay, so let's say a daily up and down, let's say a temperature, right? Let's say you have a plant that looks beautiful in the morning and it gets to two o'clock, three o'clock in the afternoon and it, the leaves burn out. Well, that didn't help, okay? It was great in the morning, but not in the afternoon. So maybe resiliency toward that type of stress. And what do you say, Rick? Uh, to allow it to grow. Yeah, or maybe strength that allows it to continue to push growth through multiple stress factors. And what do you say, uh, Joe? Yeah, okay, maybe having some type of either defense mechanism or um, immunity to certain types of diseases, right? There's actually something that they're studying in plants right now, it's called SAR, and it's called, it stands for, um, ooh, what is the A? It's systemic, um, what is the A? Resistance. Right, the A is systemic. I got it here, hold on, hold on. These are things I, you should see my Google list. <laughs> it's not a good thing for people either. Ah, uh, systemic acquired resistance, okay. So this is a genetic thing that they can, that they found in certain plants that they can actually um, insert a gene in there to change their coding and then there's a systemic resistance they can pull out of plants, it's already in there but they just insert a protein and then it says, oh hey, let's get something that's deep in our genetic code and let's pull it out and let's be more resistant to diseases. Okay, so that's something else. Well, there's other ways that that can happen. So maybe we have disease resistance, okay. If I forget, ideally for me, if I forgot to water my trees one day or if I thought it was gonna get 90 degrees but it ended up getting 105 and I said, okay, it's okay for me to come back at five o'clock and I'll water, okay. I for me, I would hope that my plants would be okay during that. You know, they're not gonna die. I missed one day of water. Some of them will, okay? They're not at that point yet, right? So that's kind of where we want it to be. We want it to look great, but we also want them to have some disease resistance, to have stress resistance, all of those other things, okay? So that's kind of where we want them to be, right? And I don't know if that's, I mean, we could probably look in the garden. You can probably pick out a few trees that you're comfortable with that. And the other trees are like, man, these are on. We're always on the fence with these trees, okay? So how do we do that? I don't exactly know, but we have a few clues and a few things now, okay? Anybody know how we can achieve that? Consistency. Okay, maybe a certain level of consistency in, in, the, in the care we give. Well, consistent, yeah, a consistent food, water, air, light, Yeah, okay. Giving them all the resources that they need, hoo-ha. <laughs> uh, uh, that will help, right? Making sure they're healthy and then they can withstand some of that, okay? Uh, so I'm just gonna share with you a few things, okay? We've talked about cultural practices, we talk about it all the time. Cultural practices are basically just what do we do to the plant? How often do we water it? How often do we repot it? When do we prune it? Those types of things. Where do we put it in the garden? All those things, right? Well, there's something else that I think that we miss sometimes, okay? And I'm gonna talk a little bit about fertilizers. I touched on it a little bit in February. Uh, Rick and I have talked about it um, quite extensively last night. But, um, so it's a combination, I think, of using chemical and um, organic fertilizers, but where to use them, 
and when to use them, okay? So why would I consider maybe a fertilizer, okay? So there are beneficial bacteria and fungi in the soil, okay, that we hear about and people, um, you know, especially organic growers and, you know, hydroponic growers, all this type of stuff. You see all these different, you know, things on the shelf, um, but what do they really do, okay? Okay, this is kind of where I want to go and to kind of leave off today is um, not that I'm saying this is an original uh, point of view, but I think we need to look at things a little bit different, all right? So the traditional point of view would be you look at the tree, oh, the tree looks great, okay? So the roots must be good, okay? Oh, and then the soil, I want to think about the soil. The tree's great, why am I thinking about anything, all right? So you kind of look at the tree and, we, and then we think about other things internally. Well, I think if we look at it the other way around, we consider the soil, not just the composition, which we spend a lot of time in when we're potting. Oh, what do you put? What mix? This, this, and that. How healthy is the soil? And I used the term last night that um, uh, Janet uh, really liked. What did I say about soil biota? Was that? I said um, vigorous soil biota or biology or something like that. Biological activity. Anyways, she kind of laughed at that. But if we look at the soil, okay. Well, that's when I said maybe we should go back to organic. Yeah, yeah, right. Okay, so if we look at the soil, okay, if we consider the soil as the living organism, we attribute a little bit more importance to it. We pay a little more attention to it, okay. Then, and if we consider the tree as a consequence or a ramification or not an afterthought, but a consequence of a healthy living soil organism, okay, living soil system, then I think we're gonna be a little bit better off, right? So just looking at it from the other side, okay? So oftentimes we're kind of looking at things with a microscope, well, let's flip it around and look at the other side. How healthy is our soil? What's that doing? And if, a, if we have really healthy soils, we're gonna have um, a really healthy tree. That's what I'm thinking, okay? Um, and I think that's kind of the true health, okay? I have a question. Mm -hmm. Yeah. On that mycorrhiza, you see that in a lot of organic yep. Is it just water activated? Is there, a, is there a time when it expires and isn't relevant anymore? Well, it depends, right? So every... Yeah, so what will happen actually, it's, it's interesting, I don't know exactly all the chemistry of the different products, but certain products are processed and kind of, they're cooked or they're denatured and it has to kind of go into the soil and it takes some time to culture into the soil, okay? Kind of similar to, um, I think it's called, is it called kefir? Anyways, my, yeah, uh, yeah, for yogurt, right? So it, it doesn't just happen right away, it kind of takes some time to culture and then you can you get your byproduct, right? Well, the same thing happens in the soil, right? Um, so some products will, ha will act a lot faster if they haven't been broken down or dead, okay? Some of them you'll keep them in the fridge. Some of them you have to keep them in a cool area, not have, some of them have a little vent on the cap because they're respiring and if you put, if you close the cap, it'll, it'll pop, okay? So uh, another term, it's kind of a, uh, um, another term is uh, bugs in a jug, that's what we call it in the industry bugs in a jug, okay? So um, there's a lot of different things like that. And some of them, most of them have to have um, a substrate to grow on and moisture to keep them alive, right? So is that, does that answer your question? Or no? It's okay. Like, you know, a lot of the yeah. Yeah, and, yeah. Right. And then may maybe you use a different uh, supplier or something like that, or a different company, yeah. Okay, right. But, okay, um, most fungi and even bacteria have what are called overwintering structures, basically structures where they can go dormant, kind of like a plant has a seed, and then when you put it, add it to the soil, it will activate, okay, and then start to grow, depending on the condition of the soil, okay? Um, let's just talk about this a little bit. I wanna touch on how this works, okay? how this works. People say, oh, use this and do that. Well, what the heck, okay? Bacteria, good healthy bacteria, what does it do? It breaks down organic material. 
well, we don't put organic material in our bonsai soils. Well, we actually do. It's called that big old thing that we spend all that time getting in there and cramming in, and then we prune its leaves and wire its branches all day long. That whole thing is organic material, okay? So the, the, the roots that grow and die and the bark that sloughs off, all that stuff, that's all organic material that's decomposing and being regenerated in the pot. Okay, so bacteria help us to break down that organic material and the organic material that we fertilize with if we're using an fer organic fertilizer, okay? If we put organic fertilizer on a thing of, you know, sterile soil media versus something that has a plant growing in it, okay, that organic material is going to decompose a lot faster where there's something growing in it versus something that's very sterile. And the whole point, the whole reason is because of that bacteria, okay? What does the bacteria do? It breaks down the organic material. Why? Basically to convert that organic material into nutrients that are available for plants, okay? All right, so a very, very good um, uh, example of this is I use uh, Dr. Earth Life. Uh, Ryan Neal uses that too. He's the one who recommended it to me. We put that on, okay? Plants seem to do okay, no big deal. Now we put on a different organic fertilizer after it, BioGold, and the plants, or the BioGold, gets eaten up very fast, almost twice as fast as it did with things that weren't inoculated with a certain bacteria or fungi. So Dr. Earth Life has bacteria and mycorrhizae fungi spores in there. Okay, so that bacteria, you can tell how healthy your soil is by how quickly your organic fertilizer gets broken down. Okay, if you put in a tea bag, it might be more difficult to figure out. Okay, but if your tea bag, you know, kind of, it all turns to mush and it's just kind of, you look and it's just kind of like fibery type stuff, maybe it's all gone, okay? And then the fungi, what do they do? They do a very similar thing, but they literally will break down organic material as well, but they have a very extensive and expansive, not a root system, actually called hyphae. It's this big network and web and they're much finer than plant roots. They can get into soil um, particles much more efficiently and they can access and exchange through chemical exchanges nutrients through the soil that plants can't do on their own. Okay, so now we have something else in there, mycorrhizae fungi that can help plants. Okay, some uh, mycorrhizae fungi will thrive in drier conditions, some will thrive in wetter conditions. I'm not sure which ones do which, okay, but that's how they help the plant. Okay, that makes sense? Yeah, did you have a question? So we're busy using the um, fast draining porous soils that we mm -hmm. use because it's easier for repotting. Yeah. And maybe we're doing our, our tree a disservice okay. by using those soils that don't contain the organic maybe. stuff. Maybe. Maybe. Because we're so busy making it easier for us to clean up. Uh huh. Soils. Well, maybe, right? But. Um, but this is pretty easy to apply back in, right? It's pretty easy. So we don't have to change the way we do our soil. We got that down for many reasons, right? Well, we can just change our fertilizer. And not all year long, maybe one or two shots of it, okay? And we can cultivate this in our soil and have a very healthy soil biology, right? Okay. Let me see what else I have here. Oh. Yeah, oh, there you go. Okay, so, and mushrooms are just the fruiting bodies of the fungi that's underneath the soil, right? Okay, so they help plants to access water and nutrients where they couldn't, all right? And what is, what do these guys get out of it? This is not just a one-way relationship, okay? This is uh, mutualistic. So plants actually provide their organic material for the bacteria and the fungi, the fungi tap into the plants and they tap in a different way depending on if it's a um, herbaceous or deciduous tree versus a conifer. Um, they tap in differently. There's endophyte and ectophyte um, type fungi. But um, so they get organic material, um, bacteria get organic material, but the fungi actually get sugars from the tree. The tree says, hey, I'm photosynthesizing enough. You're giving me nutrients. You're letting me get more water. You can have some sugar. Root, root exudates, that's what they're called, okay? Kind of like sap, and that's what it gives them, okay? Very interesting thing. Uh, 
There's a student of Ryan Neal's right now who is an arborist working on his PhD, and he's actually studying the antifungal and antibacterial properties of root exudates from plants. Okay? And root exudates are not produced for no reason. They're produced for the fungi. So if these have antifungal and antibiotic um, properties, the roots producing them for the fungi, now your bad fungus, such as Phytophthora, things like that, your plant has more things in there to fight them off. Now you're talking about like an immune system for the plant, okay? So very important. An exudate is basically, um, yeah, a sugar that's, that's exuded from the roots, right? A carbohydrate substance. Because that's what the fungi want. They need some, something for energy. They just need, they need sugar, right? And that's what the plant provides for them. All right, so what do we do? Okay, how do we uh, cultivate a healthy soil? I don't have all the answers. This is kind of a starting point. We may figure out more in the future, okay? But number one, okay, we have to make sure that there's bacteria or fungi in there, okay? We inoculate. That doesn't mean we have to grow plants that way. Plants can grow another way. Well, but if we want to get to where this ultimate goal of like, you know, true health, ultimate health, we got to do some of these things because plants have been doing this in the environment for thousands of years. Okay, so we can inoculate with them, you can use different products. I'm not sure which product is the best. What I use is Dr. Earth Life. There are just literally hundreds on the market, okay? When and how often? I do it my first, this is just what I do, okay? The first time I fertilize after repotting, this is what I use, okay? Boom. I use something, a fertilizer that has mycorrhizae fungi or bacteria in it because I want to inoculate it, okay? That's what I do. Boom, I go right away with that, okay? How often? That really depends, okay? I may do it once and then I'm putting on organic fertilizer, the plant looks great, pff, it's fine, okay? I may do it three times, okay? It really depends and I'll tell you why I would do it more often, um, okay? But how often? That will be dictated by you, okay? It might, yeah, it might, okay? And this is one of the reasons why um, fun fungi have a hard time building up. Water quality, but also some of this. So we want to reduce chemical treatments in the soil as much as possible, okay? That's why I do not like to use chemical fertilizers in the soil, because I feel like it kind of makes everything sterile a little bit, all right? But I still use chemical fertilizers as like a liquid fertilizer, like a shot, okay? So a foliar application, I still use that, all right? So, and I don't like to use fungicides or insecticides in the soil if I don't have to. There are times when you have to, okay, and you can't avoid that. But if you can, try to avoid them, all right? What did I put here, okay? So insecticides, fungicides, chemical fertilizers, okay? Sometimes you have to do it. You have to treat it, okay? But that's when, after I've made a treatment, of an insecticide that I needed, and the plant's taken it up, two weeks have passed, I'll put down another thing to try to re-inoculate the bacteria and the fungi, okay? That's when I'll put down more, all right? So when we have to use chemical treatments, let's put down some more 14 to 21 days after, okay? All right, and how can we tell if inoculation is successful? Yeah, Robert. Uh, like preventatively? Uh, not in the soil, no, not in the soil, okay? So, um, yeah, not in the soil. That may change in the future. I may, there may be a disease that I'm like, hey, I can't control unless I do it in the soil, okay? Well, I found uh, treating for a threat to the mm -hmm. uh, Yeah, and that may, work. right. And that may work well, okay? And then you may just go, well, I need to treat with this and it's gonna, it may or may not break down. And you might treat with a chemical, um, you know, uh, pesticide and then you realize, hey, the soil still seems to be pretty active. I put down another fertilizer and they're taking it up right away. It's breaking down pretty quickly. It seems okay, right? I'm not saying all chemicals are gonna kill all of your soil biological activity, but the fewer the chemical is the better, right? Okay? Balance is everything. Yep, it's all about balance, okay? So, what do I do 
Am I the type of guy who doesn't like to spray my trees? No, I, I, I was saying yesterday, I got this box, I call it my $1,000 box. I get it's all chem chemicals in there, okay? So I like to spray where the fungus is. If it's a root fungus, I put it in the roots. If it's a foliar fungus, I put it on the foliage, okay? If it's something that's systemic, if it's truly systemic, it will be systemic in the leaves as well as the roots. There are some fungicides that are systemic only one direction. You put in the roots and it goes up into the plant. And others, you put them on the leaves and won't go down into the roots. Well, that's okay if my fungus isn't in the roots. I don't care, right? So why am I going to put a chemical in the roots and wait for it to get to the foliage? Why don't I just put it on the foliage? That's what I like to do. And then I reduce messing with my soil that I've tried so long to kind of keep really good, okay, to keep a certain a certain way, whether it's from I sifted my soil, I made a certain soil mix, I got all the roots in there, and I fertilized, and I got moss, and all this stuff, and then I go pound it with a chemical, and it kills off some of that, that stuff, okay? Um, so I try to reduce that, right? Um, most systemic insecticides, or, or most systemic, systemic pesticides, fungicides, insecticides, will not go from the leaves to the roots, but they will go from one side of the leaf to the other side. It's called translaminar movement, okay? It'll go, if it hits here, it'll go straight through the leaf on the other side, okay? So most systemic fungicides will do that. Contact fungicides will not, gotta get both sides, okay? Um, but that's kind of what I do. All right, any questions on that? Interesting topic though, right? And this is, you're gonna get a lot of resistance if you, you know, try to get people on board with this. I don't know if that's what we should do or not, but I think this is kind of, um, the way that we need to go. And I don't think this is very far off base from what we've been doing already. This is what we want to do, but now maybe just looking at it from a different angle, okay? The systemic fungicides and insecticides, how long do you think it's actively in the soil? Uh, depends really on the, on the chemistry of that, that product, but um, I know that they lose their effectiveness on the, on the fungus after about 28 days. There's, yeah, there's very few fungicides on the market that, that will last, have any effect on a fungus for more than 28 days. Okay. Especially if we're hand watering all the time, things like that. Um, oh, other cultural practices we can do to try to achieve that health, and Janet was kind of alluded to this by, hey, making sure everything's okay. All right, we can make sure, we talked about this, so this is kind of our take home message today. Good light quality, right? The light, the right light, good airflow, okay, for CO2, for photosynthesis, and for cooling off of the plant. Okay, appropriate fertilizers, knowing when to use chemical versus organic, and then also using some kind of beneficial biotic activity, okay? Um, pesticide applications, consider the pros and cons, okay? Do we need to put it in the roots, or does it need to be on the foliage? If it's preventative, how long is it going to stay on the leaves? Am I just spraying it for no reason because I'm trying to get a disease that's going to come next week, I want to get it right now preventatively? Well, if you use a certain product, it might get washed off in a week, okay? So you got to think of those things, right? And then the last thing is proper watering, and you guys have probably heard this many times, but I just wanted to kind of touch on this, okay? One of the best ways to help our trees endure harsh temperatures of summer is to make sure they have a good root system. If we have also a good biological activity, that's gonna help to the plant to get water that's in the soil that they can't get on their own, okay? So water that's very tightly bound to those soil particles, okay? Um, but adapting and watering throughout the year, throughout the season, throughout the spring is actually going to help us cultivate a good healthy root system, okay? So by watering a little bit less, okay, or, or I should say more carefully, not droughting our plants during the spring, that's not what we wanna do when their roots are emerging and start to drought them, no. But watering them more carefully, okay, we can cause a little bit excess root growth, okay? We keep our soil conditions too wet, there's no reason for the roots to generate more roots because the roots that are there have plenty of water and plenty of nutrients. Well, if we keep them a little bit on the drier side or we we manage that a little bit better, we'll continue to get more root growth. Why? Because maybe there's less water, but if there's less water, there's more oxygen. More oxygen means more root growth, okay? So that's a very important, okay? So, and we talked about this root to shoot ratio. How many, how much roots do we have to how much foliage we have? Maybe moving a tree into a larger pot, a tree's really stressed in a small pot, and we move it to a larger pot, does better. Oh, it's probably because it has better roots, okay? 
because it's a little bit larger pot. Well, so that adjusts that root to shoot ratio. Another thing that we can do, okay, if we have hot temperatures, kind of what um, Joe said, if we know we got to move a tree or we got a 110 degree day coming up for some reason, and we got a tree that it's in shade, but we know it's going to be hurting, okay. I had, um, actually still have, um, Acer Compestre, which is a hedge maple down in Southern California, and I didn't have a shade cloth in a certain time of the year, and it, as soon as I got it down from Oregon, I just repotted it, and I literally got down from Oregon, and it put out a full flush of growth four days after I repotted it, and I thought, oh my goodness, this is not going to be good, All right? And so it had full leaves, it was beautiful, but I knew it wasn't much roots because I just repotted that thing. So I was really worried. 10 days later, we had 106 degree days. Okay, so I was like, oh my goodness. I cut off 50% of the foliage, didn't skip a beat. And I was like, oh, thank God. But I had to cut, I had to reduce. So every, so every pair of leaves that came out, I cut one off. And then I reduced 50% of the foliage and nothing burned on it. It didn't put on much growth because it was so hot. Was nothing strong, burned. Maybe, maybe. Okay, so, but you can do that, right? So we can, we can manage the water in our tree like physically by reducing some of the demand or, and or by co um, kind of encouraging more fine feeder roots during the spring, okay? Do not want to cut off water during, don't try to do this during the summer, okay? Not a good idea, all right? Um, let's see, I think that's it. Okay, so these are some of your take-home messages again, right? Unfortunately, the same things that help plants to grow are the same things that stress them out. It's kind of like our family, right? We love our family, but we hate our family. Same deal, right? Plants are the same way. So light is great, but too much, not so good. Too little, also not good. Temperature is great. Too hot, too cold, not good. Water is great. Too much water, too little water will kill us, okay? And the plants. Nutrients, same deal. Too much nutrients, too little nutrients, not good for the plant. So that, the take home message is Try to, try to maintain balance and order, which is very difficult, okay? Springtime is the time to get trees in shape for the summer, not the summer, okay? Summer, it's too late, all right? Adequate light, water, and sufficient nutrients equals a healthy tree. And then a healthy soil biota, that's kind of what I'm calling it. Does it result in a truly healthy tree? Maybe, maybe, okay? But we gotta figure that out. All right. Any questions on that? All right, thank you guys. Thank you.